Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches a mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm terrified and trembling. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, inside your newsletter, there's an outline there. There's household questions up on the top right uh, for you to share. Over lunch, there'll be a brief question time at the end of the sermon, God willing. Uh, We're working through a series on church. Uh, First question, uh, what is church? Here's the answer. Let me remind you. Here's the answer. Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time by God, around God, with God. That was our first question. Second question, who builds the church? Let me remind you of the answer. Jesus, as mediator and maturer, builds the church. Are there the answers that have come from God's word as we've looked at this idea of church over the last two weeks? And at least a pretty obvious question. You've already heard the question. Well, if we know what church is, if we know who builds the church, Well, who makes up the church? Who are the members of the church? And that's the question we're looking at today. Uh, Let me rephrase it in a slightly different way, uh, in a way that perhaps sharpens the question and helps illuminate the answer a little more. Remembering that sin is what separates humans from God, remembering that sin is what stops church being made by us, Remembering that the removal of sin, its penalty and judgment is what Jesus achieves for sinners like us so that church can exist. That question can be rephrased, who's actually had their sins forgiven? By Jesus alone in what he's done in his life, death and resurrection. Who makes up the church? Let me pray and we're going to answer that question. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for the encouragement this morning of hearing from your word, of affirming what we believe from your word about you, of singing your word, of being reminded of the grace that brings us together. Father, thanks that we can open your word and not just hear it read, but by your spirit to understand it, to have it applied to us as we think about who we are, as members of your church. Please do this this morning to us and in us and for us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, one of the things that's been a recurring theme, which is why we look at that Hebrews passage each week, is that uh, what's happening in heaven now is the foundation for what we are doing. And that's what we're going to be doing forever. Heaven is church. God's people gathered around him in one place at one time physically by him. So that's our template for church now. And so it makes sense that when we come to this question, we actually look at how that gathering is gathered. Who are the members of that community who are meeting forever? So if you've got your Bibles there, Hebrews 12, look at verse 22. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. In heaven, in church, is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And around God, with God, in the presence of God, we have God's community in church. Did you pick up the five descriptions of them in those verses? Let me take you through them really quickly. Uh, They are described 
as the firstborn, the assembly, the church of the firstborn. What does that mean? Oh, it's a term used of Jesus in Colossians 1.18. Remember Colossians we did two years ago? Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He's the start of a new humanity, what humans should be and can be because of Jesus. In Romans 8.29, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead so that everyone who trusts in him can be like him, follow him, be transformed to be like him. So the firstborn are those who are taking after Jesus, being remade to be like him. Secondly, they're described there as the righteous people in verse 23. That's a direct contrast to what we are by nature. What's Bernard Gabbard by nature? He's a sinner. He's wicked. He's evil by nature. He's a rebel against God. That's my natural state as a human. That's all of us, isn't it? Humans are by nature the object of God's judgment because they want his throne. Those in church are not like that. Those in the heavenly community are described as being perfectly right with God, which leads to the third description. They're made perfect. Did you see that there in verse 23? And that's an obvious contrast to what we are by nature. No one's ever described me as perfect by nature. I'm imperfect. I'm a rebel. I'm a pretender. And Hebrews 10.14 tells me that Jesus makes those who trust in him perfect. So those in church are those who've been made perfect by Jesus' life, death and resurrection. Fourthly, did you notice that they've had something spilt on them? Did you notice that there in verse 24 to the sprinkled blood that's better than any other type of blood? What, what blood's that? Well, we're going to celebrate that today, aren't we? Isn't it great that we've got the Lord's Supper today to remind us of that? The blood of Jesus. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 says that Jesus purchased this mob by this price, his blood. In Colossians 1.20 it tells us that that blood brings God and humans together, creates peace between them, pays their ransom like we heard last week and turns aside God's judgment, which brings me to the last description, the fifth one. They have a mediator. Did you see that there in verse 24? That kind of brings all of those previous four descriptions together. In Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we have death beaten for us by the one who stands between God and the rebels. We have sin removed from us by the one who stands between God and the rebels. We have a picture of what we will be as sin is taken away. We have reconciliation, two warring parties brought together because Jesus has lived, died and risen to remove our judgment and to make us perfect. So who makes up the church? Well, it's everyone who has Jesus as their mediator. Everyone who trusts in what Jesus has done. But who are they? Because you always want to dig deeper, don't you? Who are they? It's worth thinking a little harder about these people. I'm at point three on the outline because if they've had a mediator, something's happened. Something has changed. It sounds like they're people with a past who've had a momentous event and they've now been transformed. Uh, that other reading that Rappi brought us from Ephesians chapter 2, the one that was the foundation for our first song, helps us understand that past change present transformation. It's a passage that many of us are familiar with, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. It's a passage that many of us have been comforted and encouraged by. But I want you to notice today that it revolves around two phrases that are repeated twice. And those two phrases help us understand what's going on. Now, the first phrase, if you've got your Bibles there, in Ephesians chapter 2, the first phrase is in verses 1 and 5. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, even though we were dead in trespasses. 
Put really literally, being dead by sin. Being dead by sin. In the past, these people were like every other human being. They were dead. They were dead. Spiritually dead and so physically dead. Even though they looked really terrific. Even though their wardrobe sparkled. Even though they were able to function in society, they are dead. Sin, the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not, has produced a death sentence over them and in them. They're the walking dead because they are separated from God and under God's judgment. That's the state of every human, isn't it, by nature? Who we are. And so humans on their own can never be members of church. They're sinners. They're separated from God. They can do nothing. They are dead. The second phrase is in verses 5 and 8. You are having been saved by grace. You are having been saved by grace. And the, the two phrases mirror each other. There's a state of existence and there's an instrument. Did you pick that up? Dead by sins. Saved by grace. And they contrast each other. They show two separately opposed ways of life. One is a life of death, which sounds really strange, and one is a life of salvation. Death is brought by sin. Salvation and true life comes by by grace. Grace is God's mercy to those who deserve his judgment. It doesn't come from within us. It comes from outside because we're dead. Dead people can't do anything. It's undeserved. It produces salvation from sins when we deserve judgment for our sins. It's from God, not from us, because God is the one we sin against. And that grace comes through Jesus Christ. That's the crucial thing. God's people are made by God's grace in Jesus Christ. They receive this, taking it on trust that God has done it all. So here is our answer. Those who make up the church are those who by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus have had their sins forgiven. That's the membership criteria. But there's one last question we've got to answer before we finish. How do we know them? I I love turning up at touch footy. The colours weren't to my liking of that touch footy team, but I love turning up at touch footy because I could see who was on my team by the jersey and I'd go and gather with them and then we'd play. How, How do we know who to gather with? How do we know who's in the church? More importantly, rather than just a measure for working out who's in and out and that's a misuse of the answer to this question, How do I know I am? It's a really important question, isn't it? Because it's not obvious. The Bible tells us it's not obvious. In Colossians 3 it says they're hidden in Jesus. Uh, Romans 8.19 says they'll only be completely known on the last day, fully revealed. So how do we know who they are? How do we know we are? You've heard the kids talk and the answer is pretty simple. The first way we know who is a member of God's church is by what they say. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus is Lord. And the crucial demonstration of that is that Jesus was raised from the dead. He's not just a good bloke. He's not just a gifted teacher. He's not just a misunderstood figure from history. He's the boss of the universe. He's the Lord. And not only is it a proclamation, Jesus is Lord, it's a practice that Jesus is Lord. Listen to Colossians 2, 6 and 7, a memory verse from two years ago. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk 
in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. Proclamation and practice. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's how you know who makes up the church. So let me just recap on that point four on the outline. Question, who makes up the church? Rephrase, who's had their sins dealt with so that they can meet with God? Given a sketch in Hebrews 12, five things. Firstborn, perfect, righteous, return to right relationship with God by the blood of Jesus, our mediator. Just like any other human, but there has been a fundamental change in them by God's grace. Move from death to salvation, from sins to grace. The common name for those people? Christians. How do you know them? They proclaim Jesus is Lord and they practice Jesus is Lord. So who makes up the church? It's there on your outline. Christians make up the church. Those who by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus have had their sins forgiven. So let me close with three observations. Membership in the church is solely by what God has done through Jesus. Membership in the church is solely by what God has done through Jesus. It's not whether you purchased a pew. It's not whether you donated the cypress pine for the building. It's not whether you reach a certain educational standard, family heritage, or employment prospect. It's not because your family has always come here. It's not even because you taught X, Y, or Z. Membership in the church is solely by what God has done through Jesus by grace. That means that members of the church are the most humble people on earth because they know who they are. They're rebels made perfect. They're pretenders who've been made perfect. They're sinners who've been forgiven. Observation two. Church on earth has both visible and invisible members. That's been the case right throughout history, hasn't it? If you read your Bibles, not all those who attend church are members of church. Not all those who attend church are members of church. There's the visible. They're those who gather together. But not everyone who gathers has trusted in what Jesus has done. And that will be revealed on the last day, completely, fully. But we've already been given an indicator of what membership looks like now, haven't we? What was it? Proclamation and practice. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. And so I want to ask you in a fairly pointed question, is that what you proclaim and practice? Is that what you proclaim and practice? Remember what we've said already about what church is and who builds the church. Applying those is a proclamation and practice of the lordship of Jesus. Third observation, church membership is heaven membership and vice versa. Heaven membership is church membership. The eternal church is in heaven. But let me share with you a very common misconception that I meet weekly. Death is how you get into heaven for everyone. They've died, they've gone to heaven. That's wrong. And it's wrong on a number of levels. But let me ask you, if you spend your whole life denying the lordship of Jesus, why would the Lord then welcome you into his house for eternity? He won't. He won't. You are welcomed in, not by your death, not by your deeds, not by your diplomas or your degrees, not even just by your deeds. You are welcomed in by what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. His grace applied in a life that proclaims and practices the lordship of Jesus. Who's that available to? 
Every single human being. Every single human being who desires the forgiveness of their sins and their restoration. So not only must church be the most humble of gatherings, it's also going to be the most welcoming, isn't it? We know who we are. We know what has made us. And we know how good that is for everyone. Who makes up the church? Those who have had their sins forgiven by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus shown in the proclamation and practice of Jesus is Lord. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Father, it's a, it's a good reminder to a bloke like me who gets wrapped up in deeds and doing stuff but needs to realise that his membership of the church rests in your deeds and what you have already done. Father, thank you that you sent your son Jesus to live, die and rise so that our sins are dealt with and we receive all of his perfection. Father, thank you that in this Jesus is Lord. Father, please enable us to proclaim and practice the lordship of Jesus because we have received your grace. Amen. Any questions? Baxter. By practice, what do you mean? Strike a light, Baxter. That's a good question, and I'm going to repeat it for the people who are on the live stream at home. By practice, what do you mean? Uh, uh, let, let me just repeat that phrase. What was the phrase that I used? Jesus is Lord. Okay. Here, here's something fairly radical. Uh, you often hear people talk about priority lists in life, don't you? Uh, God first, family second, church third, me fourth. Uh, let me really simplify that list for you. There's only one entry. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> really simple list. And then you look at what that means in every part of your life. What does it mean for Jesus is Lord for my marriage? What does it mean for Jesus is Lord for my time management? What does it mean Jesus is Lord for my employment decisions? What does it mean Jesus is Lord for X, Y, Z. It's a much simpler list, isn't it? And let me tell you that in all of those areas, the Bible gives very clear wisdom, doesn't it? Jesus is Lord looks like this. Jesus is Lord looks like this. So that's what I mean, Baxter. And that has consequences, doesn't it? Because if you're not familiar with what God means by Jesus is Lord, you're not going to be able to live Jesus is Lord, are you? How do you get familiar with what God means by Jesus is Lord? Where will you find that? In the Bible. In the Bible. And that will actually set out what Jesus is Lord looks like right throughout life. In fact, you could read a gospel. Let Take Mark because we're reading through that as a family and you get a very good example of what God is Lord means, don't you? And where do you get that? In the life of Jesus and how he makes decisions about work and time management and priorities and family. Does that answer your question, Baxter? Terrific. That was a head nod for the cameras. Any other questions? Warwick. Yes. Yeah, so a, a Warwick's picked up an important, uh, what there's practice and there's practice, okay? And I, and I think the heart of the practice that the Bible talks about Jesus is Lord is captured in the word. What word does the Bible use most to describe Christians in the New Testament? Disciples. What's a disciple? A follower. Uh, you're right, Penny. It's a wholehearted student follower. That's what practice means. Okay, a wholehearted student follower. So I could say I'm a member of that touch footy team, I've paid my fees, got the uniform, I could turn up for maybe one game in six. I'm practising. Am I a wholehearted member of the team? No. Okay, and I think that's a very clear application of what it means to practise, but it's about all of life. So it's a wholehearted student follower of Jesus everywhere.
in every part of your existence, okay? Um, and that means wherever you are, uh, as a young mum, as an older mum, as an auntie, as a grandparent, uh, as a worker, as a retiree, as a student, as a school member, or as, as a university member, wholehearted student follower, that's what practice means. Does that clarify your answer a bit? Terrific. That's a thumbs up.